Mitch, appreciate you joining me. I know it has been an incredibly hectic week. You were in Haiti visiting the orphanage that you run, Have Faith Haiti, and chaos obviously broke out in Haiti. Take us through when you first realized there was a very real and legitimate problem. Well, I go to Haiti every month and have for the last 14 years uh, since I've been operating this orphanage, which I started right after the earthquake. So I'm somewhat used to the uh, chaos in Haiti. Uh, we were even there during the assassination of the president, Jovenel Moise, and the country shut down then and it became very violent. So uh, that's not such news to me, but with this trip we had brought with us, along with my wife, who goes with me all the time, we brought eight volunteers with us. And many of them had never been to Haiti before. One of them had never been out of the country before. And right after we got there, the gang violence surged. They uh, broke into a very big prison and released thousands of very dangerous criminals. The airports were immediately shut down, taken over by the gangs. The ports were taken over by the gangs. The roads were owned by the gangs. The borders were shut. So very quickly, all options for leaving disappeared. And uh, I began to think we're not going to be able to get out of here. And of course, the volunteers didn't really sign up for that when they decided to come help in an orphanage. And so, you know, we tried the normal routes of the embassy and, you know, uh, American contacts. Hey, are you going to be able to help us? And we basically got stonewalled and just told, you know, well, there's nothing we can do. Uh, just shelter in place. Are you taking bullets? You know, and I said, well, if we're taking bullets, why are you telling us to shelter in right. place? Uh, so there wasn't any help coming from them. And then we read that they evacuated. And so it was pretty clear that, uh, if we were going to find a way out, we were going to have to do it independently. And we began to explore those options. How did you, you know, what was going through your heart and your mind as you're trying to explore those options? You know, there's no way out. You know, this is very different from the things you experienced in the past. What, what was sort of going through your mind during that? Well, First of all, I was worried about our kids and not so much us because what was happening was was really going to affect them short term and long term. So what we did, what we spent our time doing was uh, stockpiling food, stockpiling fuel, stockpiling water, getting cash if we could get to a bank. Because I, we know, you know, when the country shuts down, if the gangs take over the, the, the terminals for fuel, you can't get any gas. Uh, suddenly you can't buy food because the markets are closed. So we always know how to spring into that kind of mode very quickly and, and double up our security forces and things like that. So while we were doing that, um, I was I was thinking, OK, you know, who do I know that can get us out of here? And uh, that's not something in 14 years that I've had to face in terms of, you know, trying to arrange a, a helicopter or some kind of, you know, trip to the to the uh, water and getting on a boat in the middle of the night. Uh, and so we began to make calls to people. And to be honest, we had three failed attempts uh, before the one that successfully worked. One of them left us on a hill, hilltop in, uh, in the middle of uh, an area of Haiti uh, when the sun came up and a helicopter was supposed to come and pick us up and it never came. And there were 10 of us just standing on a hill with our little bags waiting. And then about an hour later, we found out that the <laughs> It wasn't it wasn't able to come uh, because of they were shooting, uh, you know, in the area. And so we had to scurry back to the cars and race back to the orphanage. Uh, but then we were contacted by Corey Mills, who is a U.S. congressman, and Lisa McLean, who is also a congressperson, neither one of which were acting on behalf of the government, but in a private fashion. And they said, we've heard what's happened to you. We want to come get you out. It, this is it's remarkable. and I don't want to spend too much time here. I've, I've heard this about Representative Mills you know, doing this in other situations as well. What do you make of that? I mean, there are other people who are also still there and who are still trapped there. I, I spoke to somebody earlier today and they're getting the same response. Nobody's really helping from the government side. And then to have people in government who are doing it independently. What what do you make of that? It would seem like we would have a plan for this sort of thing, you would think. It seems the least likely person who would help organize a trip would be a member of the government that wasn't seemingly interested in getting people out. But uh, I guess that's part of the irony of it is that those two people in Congress, they know they said, I mean, they said to me, don't expect any help from the government. And they're in the government. Wow. So, uh, you wow. know, I took them at their word. And I said, well, look, I don't care who it is. I don't care what government, I don't care private or whatever. One of the places that we were dealing with wanted, you know, uh, six figures uh, in money to try to get us out. 
uh, I said, I don't care, you know, who we have to deal with as long as they can do it. And uh, it turned out that Corey Mills and Lisa McLean were able to get it done. You know, it's um, yeah, it's just an incredibly um, troubling situation there. Obviously, now you guys, you end up finding a way out and you had to do this in the dead of night. Take us through that, because this is dangerous. People have to keep in mind there are gangs, there's violence. If it's light, as you were saying, with the sun coming up, that puts you in danger, right? Yeah. In fact, there was an aborted attempt, uh, which I aborted. Uh, the night before because they were coming in from America with this helicopter and they, they had to stop in, in one island and then another island to refuel. And then they were leaving from that island to try to get over to Haiti. And I looked at my watch and I tried to do the math. And I said, I think you're going to be getting here when the sun is coming up. And they said, well, it's still OK because, you know, people are not really up and about. And I said, no, you don't understand Haiti. I mean, 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, everybody's up and awake and moving around and they all have their phones out. And if a helicopter starts flying in, they're going to film it. And if it's near our orphanage, they're going to say, why is this helicopter coming into this orphanage? Is it bringing the prime minister with it? Rumors start flying around. And I could envision a scene where, you know, we were mobbed at our at our orphanage or gangs attacked us. So I said, this cannot be done in the in the daylight. And and they were about to leave. And I said, please, please don't come now. And, and, and you know, we had some tense words about it. But eventually they they deferred to the fact that I was on the ground. Uh, and they waited until the next night. The next night became a different adventure altogether, which I'm happy to tell you about if you want to know. Yeah, take us through, because, you know, in reading and seeing some of what you've described, it seems unimaginable uh, what you guys had to do, and you ended up in a very small space, too, all 10 of you. So take us through those events. Well, you have to imagine that this is 10 people now, uh, most of whom have not gone through anything like this in their life. They're mentally exhausted because of these stops and starts, they don't know when they're going to see their families. They, and now I'm saying to them, a helicopter is going to come in the middle of the night and get us out under darkness. It's not what they signed up for, obviously. Um, and we were waiting for this helicopter to come at three o'clock in the morning at a different location than we had had the night before. And I'm not going to share that with you. Uh, and, and we were too tired to stay up till three o'clock in the morning. I mean, everybody was wiped out. And so we were in these chairs and on the floor and we just said, well, we'll just set our alarms for two o'clock and we'll get up at two o'clock. And we had one bag a piece and uh, and we'll just be ready to go at three o'clock. And at about five to two, I, you know, I lay my head down. It was the first time I slept in two days and I must have been so asleep that my wife nudged me. She said, I think your phone's binging. Your phone is binging. I looked over and it was five to two. So my alarm hadn't gone off, but there were bings on, on my text message. And the last one said, are you getting these messages? Exclamation point, exclamation. Point. And I, I looked and there have been five messages before that said, we have to come earlier. You have to go now. Oh, wow. 30 minutes <laughs> out, 20 minutes out, 15 minutes out. And I did the math and we were like six minutes away. And and so we had to wake up everybody in the pitch dark. And then my thing bings again. It says no bags, just passports. Had to change aircraft. So we said, you can't take your bags, leave your bags. And everyone's like, what, 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 where, what, I have to find my passport. And, you know, everything had to happen in a couple of minutes. And then we ran outside and flashed the lights so that they could see where we were. And just like in one of those movies, you know, you see a light coming out of the sky. You hear, blah, 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 blah. And next thing you know, there's a thing on the ground. Guy jumps out. I think it was Corey Mills and said, let's go, let's go, let's go. And everybody runs in. And we thought, they told us it was a 12-person helicopter they had four seats in it and so there was no place to sit down or take us so we just wow in and we just jumped in on top of one another and next one on top of the next one it was like a big human ball and i think it turned out to be 67 seconds from the time that the plane came down to when the door closed and we lifted up again the air, helicopter rather and then of course that's when you hold your breath because you don't want anybody shooting at you uh, from from the ground uh but very quickly we were up in the air there were no shots and then we, uh, you know, we headed uh, out and and they said to us, don't make any noise and don't turn on your phones until we're out of Haitian airspace. And about 20, 25 minutes later, uh, they said, OK, you're out of Haitian airspace. And and all the people who were with us kind of clapped and said, yeah, but for my wife and I, it was kind of a gut punch because like it was the reality that we were out of Haiti and our kids were, were still there. And and, uh, you know. So I'm happy to be home, but I'm kind of heartbreaking, heartbroken to be away from the away from our kids. Well, and, and I want to mention this because this is incredibly important. And you and I have talked in the past and, and told your story, but I, I want to just 
remind people, you're a best-selling author. You could be out doing whatever you want to do with your life. And the bulk of your time is spent taking care of these kids and this orphanage. It's an incredible story and the pain of having to leave them. What happens now for them in the midst of this? And, and how do you sort of move forward managing things remotely? Well, you know, fortunately, we have communication. Uh, we, we talk all day long, myself and my director. We have 40 staff and 60 children. And uh, I talk to the kids. You know, we FaceTime and things like that. They've been through this before. Unfortunately, you know, like when we do our nightly devotions, um, you can hear all the gunfire in the background. I, it's such a juxtaposition. It doesn't make sense. You know, they're singing these beautiful songs to God about being grateful for what they have. Um, there's that song, you know, you've given me love and a fine family. Thank you, Lord, for, for the, your blessings on me. And you can hear while they're singing that, you know, out, out in the street. I mean, like rapid fire, machine gun kind of fire. And, uh, you know, it's a shame that they have to live with this. It's, it's, a, it's a crime that they can't go out for three years. They haven't left the grounds of our orphanage. No one's been able to go even out in the street. We couldn't take them for an ice cream or a pizza. We couldn't take them to the beach. We, I mean, they, know, they don't even know what's outside the gates because it's wow. just too dangerous with the, with the gangs out there. When we come, we have to take bulletproof cars just to get from the airport to the, to the mission and then back again. And we never leave when we're there. So we're trying to manage it from afar. We've doubled up our security. It takes a lot of money. They've, cha they've charged the prices for fuel immediately. As soon as this happened, boom, 30% more to buy fuel if you can find it anywhere. And if you have to have fuel because there's no electricity, you know, you only get three or four hours of electricity a day. And then if you don't have a generator, you can't turn your lights on. You can't have a refrigerator where you have to feed 100 people. Uh, so everything, everything is such a struggle in Haiti just to get through the day. And I have been you know, wailing about this to the community. And I do programs like yours just to try to get people to say, we have an obligation to make life easier for the children of a country like this. They didn't ask to be born there and, and they shouldn't have to go through such a limited terrorized existence all the time where they say, Mr. Mitch, are, are the gangs going to come over the walls? Are they going to shoot us? You know, why should, and why should any child have to ask that question? So I'm, 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 I'm beseeching our leaders to get more involved in Haiti than just sending some money and hoping a force from Kenya comes over and takes care of the problems. I don't think that's the answer. Well, and you and you have put your entire life into this. You're you're putting your actions, you know, to your words on this. You have been doing this. Last question, because I don't want to keep you any longer. You've been incredible. And I know this has been a crazy week. How can people help? I know obviously prayer. How can people practically help you, your organization, and the orphanage? Well, I mean, First of all, prayer is, is paramount. Um, and, uh, people, we had so many people praying for us. I, I couldn't list it. I couldn't read it. How many how many texts and that we're praying for you? And I'm sure the collective power of that prayer helped kept keep us protected when we were taken up in the air in that helicopter. But secondly, pray for all the people who still haven't gotten out because there are many Americans, many Canadians, many foreigners who come in there to help in Haiti. Most of them are doing what I'm doing. They're working with an orphanage. They're doing. Uh, water projects or food projects or, or health projects or things like that. They just go of the goodness of their heart and now they can't get out. And they, they need to be remembered and not forgotten. And there needs to be a concerted real effort, not one helicopter at a time, to get those people safely out. And third, most important is to pray for the kids and pray for the people of Haiti who deserve better than this. If people want to help our particular orphanage, it's called Have Faith Haiti Orphanage, and you can find it at havefaithhaiti.org. And it's very clear if you go there, havefaith80.org, what, what, what you can do to help. But there are many other organizations besides ours that deserve help. And, you know, just don't forget about it. That's the thing I would ask people. It's easy to forget about another country. It's easy to say, why should we get involved with any other country? But this is not just any other country. This is right off of our shores. It's an hour away but from Miami on plane. We occupied that country for 15 years. We ran it. In the early 1900s, we helped write their constitution. We held their money in our banks. We have a history in that country, and we owe it to them to take care of their people, at least so that they don't have to fear for their lives just to go buy food in a market. Mitch, I appreciate you and all you do and just, you know, your whole story and you joining us during such a chaotic week. Thank you for your time today. It's my pleasure. Thank you for your interest in your prayers.